All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, show where we code a complete game live on stream, and we need to, uh, you know, move things around. Is basically what's going on here. Um, we are sort of in like a little bit of an interim area. Uh, the code is, you know, pretty playable right now for engine feature stuff, but we just need to like put in the sorts of things that I don't normally do, uh, like, you know, combat and those sorts of things. These are usually someone else's job and not really something I'm particularly, you know, well-versed in. So I don't have much in the way of opinions about it, but as you can see right now, um, what we did on the last stream is we sort of cleaned up a little bit of how we're going to uh, handle this stuff. And we we made the gloves because they used to be um, like things like the glove and also uh, like this this thing out here. You can see um, there's like this skull thing. Those were like floating creatures. So there were hopping creatures and floating creatures. And like the floating creatures were like the glove and the skull, the big skull. Uh, and then there was this little, like, skeleton thing here that we had that hopped around, and the hero, those were hopping creatures. And hopping creatures, like, move via transaction, like, base movement. So they basically query a square to see if they can move into it, and if they can, they will move into it, and if they can't, they won't. So it's, it's like, a very, like, it's, it's sort of almost turn-based. It's, it's not turn-based because it's happening in real time, but it has the same sort of semantics as if you were just taking turns uh, at the frame level. But it's it's basically that, right? Um, and we sort of didn't really have a plan for what we wanted to do. Uh, you know what I mean? We, 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 we didn't really know. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the audio. Maybe that's what we were going to do today. Oh, yes, I can't hear that. I'm sorry I tortured you. Um, we were going to move the audio to a separate thread. That's what we were going to do today. Should we do that? I'm going to do the movement first. Uh, let's do that. Let's do that next week. I'm going to turn. Let me just turn off the, the sound for you there. Um, and, uh, and that way I won't, I won't torture you with that. So, uh, there's two things that are happening there, and I guess I don't know exactly how we would want to turn them off, but uh, probably the easiest thing to do would be to just not bother updating the sample buffer, right? Um, so, you know, like the the output playing sounds thing. I should probably put on a headphone so I can make sure I don't torture you guys with this. Hold on a second. Um, let me just see what happens here if we just, when we do the output playing sounds thing, we just don't actually bother. So, output playing sounds is this code right here gets called from here. Uh, and I just don't know, can I do this? If the thing is, I, I may have to clear the buffer because it may be garbage, right? Um, and so we'll hear what happens if it is. Nope. So that's an easy way, right, uh, to just if zero around that. And, um, you know, one of the things I've done recently that I kind of liked um, is I introduced a thing that's like capital temporary, like that. Um, and what I do is I'll do like if zero and then you do temporary so that you know that you didn't mean to do that permanently. It's just kind of a nice thing. And you can put that on anything if you just go into like the place where you have the rest of your stuff, like your assert macro or whatever, like wherever you have your sort of things that you do. Um, you can define like temporary as nothing. And then you can just put temporary in places, and if you then search for it, um, you can find all the places where it's used. This is not a case-sensitive search here in Forcoder, I don't think, so that's why you get a couple other things. But basically, you get the idea, right? Uh, so I kind of liked that. I probably should have used that for a long time. I just never really did for some reason. Um, 
but it is something that I kind of liked. So yeah, I don't know if I, I don't really want to move the mixer today. I don't think that's what I wanted to do. So that that is what we sort of said we we're going to do last week, but I think I'm like, nah, nah I'm not going to do that today. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to just get some of the movement stuff working better with like how these entities are going to move around. Right now, moving the hero actually feels fine. Um, you kind of just hold down the key um, till you get where you're going and then you let go uh, and it feels fine. So I don't really think we need to do much with hopping. Like we'll probably clean up the code that does it because we're kind of working on that system now and we, we probably want things to be a little cleaner for our own uh, purposes, right? And we want to do a trailing edge triggers of things like hopping. So for example, the, 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 these lighting up before you land on them, right? That's because the transactional movement system currently fires that event when you start the hop to, to take a square rather than uh, afterward. Does this make sense? Um, so we really don't want uh, to do stuff like that. So we want to clean up that code a little bit. But in terms of how it feels right now, it actually feels fine. It feels totally fine to use. Like, I feel like I could play it like this. Maybe it needs some tuning. Um, once I actually start to do, like, combat, maybe I'll feel some issues there that I'm like, oh, I probably should clean up this or that. But at the moment, it feels pretty reasonable to use. So really what we're talking about is, like, things like the glove. So for starters, I need a way to move the glove around with the hero as the hero hops around and just make it, you know, like I want the glove to basically just follow wherever the hero is. Um, it should just be locked, basically. Like I want it to feel more like an action game. I didn't like the physics-y feel of it before. I was like, yeah, this is kind of interesting, but not quite what I was going for. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to have the glove be like right next to the hero, right, uh, at all times. And then I want to have it so that if I, when I actually do like a, a attack, which is like what I'm doing now, the glove kind of sweeps out a prescribed pattern, I guess. And, you know, maybe like the, may, one of the things I had sort of toyed with on the last stream is maybe that pattern is sort of like dependent on what glove you're using. Like, maybe some of them just go out one square, like a simple little punch, like a jab. But then others maybe do, like, a sweep, like a pattern. Um, you know? So, like, the glove is basically sweeping out, like, patterns on the tiles. Um, and different gloves have different patterns. You know? Like, if you think about it, like, suppose that the gloves just have, like, some stats, right? And the stats are, like, how fast, like, how much damage does it do when it hits things? How fast does it go, right? Um, and And which set of squares does it go through? And, you know... Um, the other thing you could do is say that's per square. So, like, when we do, you know, like, I don't know. I'm just sketching this out here. I'm not a game designer. This is not my freaking job, man. Somebody else should have to figure this out. Uh, not me. So, yeah, like, engine programmers are not supposed to have to be responsible for this stuff. So, you know, someone else should have to do this. But the point is, so suppose the entity, right, it's, it's a, I, I kind of had this, this idea last time, I, I think I called it a, like a move queue, right? And 
the idea behind the move queue was just that you would stack up some things in here. So like, for example, if you were going to go ahead and uh, do a, a punch, it would like add in the punch uh, squares that the, that glove, whatever that glove's sort of move pattern is, it would add them in and then it will trace those out. And that's just a given. Like that's it's like you're it's it's sort of it's a little bit dark soulsy. Although you know I would I probably I don't love that kind of thing. So I would I would probably add a thing where you can recall the glove in the middle of a punch, right? Uh, I I pro and and maybe like sometimes you can't. So maybe there's a little bit of a dark soulsy thing for certain parts of the move. Uh, and so basically when you get these gloves, we'd have different like code for the gloves where we'd say, well, some of the gloves put in like this pattern, some put in this pattern, and maybe each of these, you know, has other stuff associated with it even. So, you know, when you put in a move queue entry, you have things like, is it interruptible? But maybe you, you could also have things uh, right like, you know, a, a damage value um, or a speed value right um i don't know maybe those are f32s i don't know how we want to do this uh where like you could imagine that as we do the gameplay it might be fun to be able to create gloves where like the first two squares don't really do any damage or not very much but then like the last square does or something like that you know what i mean um so things like that you know what i'm saying uh, basically giving you ways to to make choices when you're when you're sort of kidding up and also to like sort of provide that kind of binding of Isaac sort of feel where you like want to have the runs be kind of sometimes dramatically different like oh in this game you know I had a glove that's very like short distance but high damage and in this other one, I had one that's like, you know, very wide circles, but very small damage over the whole thing. And in another one, I had one that like basically couldn't do any damage like near me, but it could do a lot of damage far away. Right. And so, you know, those would change sort of the hopping patterns that you have to use, like how you're kind of trying to move around and how you're trying to like um, play against the enemies. And that seems like the kind of thing that's pretty important in these sorts of games where you're like, hey, we want to play randomly generated dungeons and have, like, a different experience every time that's not, like, always exactly the same, uh, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. What I would do is... In the brain code when you go to do an attack i guess there's a question of what we should do if the like just trying to think of like what the actual gameplay would be you punch it adds the things into the move queue the glove is now in strike mode so so let's do this first because I'm not really a game designer, right? Uh, what I would mostly want to do is do the the most straightforward thing first, and then I guess try to feel how it feels when I'm doing it and see what happens. So like if you, for starters, when you do an attack, it'll just always complete the entire attack and you have to wait for the glove to return to you, right? So basically, like, you won't be able to recall the glove is the first thing we'll code. We'll see what that feels like, and then, assuming that I don't fully like that, because I, I don't think I will, I'll want a way for you to probably recall the glove early, or at least for some gloves, I would want you to be able to do that. So, like, you know, maybe some gloves that are very powerful, you can't do that, so it's, like, part of the downside of using, you know a particularly powerful glove or something is that it can't be recalled. That's fine and whatever. Um, but, uh, 
when, will use what it feels like to not be able to recall it to guide us to how you will, because I guess I don't know how you would do it. Like, for example, if you try to do an attack, it puts the attack in there. While the glove is still in motion, do I, if I hit another attack, like I, I try to hit attack again, does that recall the glove? Like, would that be how you recall the glove? And if you do, does it also launch the attack you requested, or does it not do that? Right? Um, you know, uh, does it just, like, cancel the attack if you push an attack button but while the glove is still out? It just recalls the glove, and so you double tap to recall and restrike. Right? I mean, there's just a lot of different ways you could do that, and I don't... I'm just having trouble, like, envisioning what it will feel like, so I just want to do it, you know what I mean, and see. Because you may want to be able to recall the glove without launching a new attack, right? Um, like, you could imagine you don't want the glove to hit something it was about to hit, so you recall it, and you don't really want to a attack anything. You just want it to cancel, right? So it kind of feels, it feels to me like you want the ability to cancel, without, like, like oh, I, I sent this glove out to, to do a wide punch, but it's going to hit this barrel that explodes, and I don't want it to do that yet because, like, the enemy, like, hopped away, and I want to, like, recall it. But I don't want to re-punch in a direction. I want to save the punch because I want to time it for something that's about to happen, right? So it feels like at least four responsive gloves, like gloves that don't, you know, have the downside of uncancelable or whatever, right? Which which would probably be a thing as well. For gloves that are supposed to be more responsive, I feel like you're going to want, like, more meticulous control. And I just don't know, like... Yeah. I just don't know what you would push. Like, I don't really want a separate key, but I don't know. Maybe you need a separate key. I don't know. But it's too early to worry about that. Let's just get the basic thing working first, and then we'll start to we'll worry about that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to kind of get a feel for what it should actually be like. You know what I mean? Um, so we'll see. All right. Well, um... Yeah, and oh, so let me say one other thing. What if a glove has, like, aftertouch, right? Like, what if one of the gloves, one of the properties a glove can have is you can, like, chain attacks on the glove. So, like, I can I can do, like, an up and then a right on the glove, and it'll do it, like, w without re coming back to me, right? Like, who knows what other stuff there might be that we want to do? So, yeah, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I think, like, I don't think, like, hitting an attack button should recall the glove pretty much ever. Um, you know what I mean? I guess. All right, so let's just do it. I don't know. I really don't. So we're just going to try it here. So if we look at some of these, you can see we've got like these attacked uh, and D sword stuff. So I don't really think that's quite how we're going to want to write it. Uh, the D sword thing is sort of correct, like this V D sword thing here, uh, and attacked as two values are plausible as what we want, but it's D sword is not really the word for it. What we're gonna want here instead is more like two bases, like. We're going to want to say, okay, we have these movement patterns for the glove, and they're going to be written probably like as if they go, I don't know, like up and down or something, or to the right. And then we're going to rotate those patterns depending on which way you you ask to, to attack. The glove is going to rotate its pattern into that direction, right? So we're going to have a thing here where we would do, like, it would be more of, like, an attack X and attack Y. That's which kind of square, you know, which um, 
movement direction we have for each of the of the squares, right? That that's more what it would be. Um there's sort of another thing here and in fact the move queue may be it may be more like this. And one of the things that's kind of annoying about Handmade Hero is because we originally did something that allowed arbitrary like geometry, if that makes sense, um, we don't really have a grid per se. So even though like the game looks grid based, it's actually arbitrary. Like those squares could be completely arbitrary. And so we kind of have this annoying uh, aspect here where this is not an integer. It's actually just a floating point value that says where you would want to go, kind of, and you like have to sort of look to see what you would hop to, which really sucks. Um, but there's a lot of things that really suck about sort of the way we did things. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast, and also being on stream where you don't have very much time to fix things. So, you know, that kind of sucks, but point being, the attack X, attack Y, and attacked values now, they would be a slight modification for how we were doing things before. So when we look at those attack values, which are like this little thing here, and it kind of looks at like which but buttons you pushed, um, I guess I don't know what you would do if you push two attack buttons at the same time. Uh, you know, I guess we just else clause this for now. Um, although actually, you know, even that's not really that necessary because it's just, it just changes which one you're going to do. You're going to only do one or the other. Uh, so we don't really have a good, a good idea about like what we would do there. You know, we, we don't really know, like, like if you push two buttons at the same time, I don't think... I think we just flip flip a coin, right? Like, uh, I, I don't, I don't, hmm. Like, I don't know if what we expect to do there is to... So, you know what? I take it back. I, I I guess we do sort of know. Maybe. I'm going to maybe I'm going to maybe call that a, a future topic there because in theory if we were going to do this where you could rapidly queue in things like you don't have to wait and you want to do a like up left attack or whatever um i could imagine wanting that to be a like i, I could imagine wanting this to actually be an event queue that you read so when you look at game controller input here, you actually like look through and see. Now, the problem is that, you know, the super crappy X input stuff, which is like really, really lousy, um, doesn't really give you a good way to, to say like what's the order in which these buttons were pressed. Um, you would have to just like pull at a high frequency, I guess. Which makes like no sense because the thing's USB, so there's nothing to pull. It like sends it to you across a wire. It was really dumb, uh, but that's just X input for you. So, yeah, I don't know. We're gonna do it like this for now, but I do think this is a little bit bad, um, or maybe a lot bad, uh, as the case may be. But we'll see. So if you push the up button, then you know, the X in this case would be the normal, um, well, so I guess we have to decide how we want to encode these. You know, I think everything encoded as if it's fading, as if it's facing rightward is probably the most sensible thing, just because that's how like math works with circles. Angle zero, right, produces a vector pointing to the right. So we might as well try to keep with that convention. 
Uh, so really, action right, let's order these and let's order these in circle order just to make it easier on ourselves. So action right, um, we would expect that encoding to be the normal encoding, right? The one where x is x and y is y. No change. For up, which would be the next one, and down would be last. So it'd be it'd be right, up, left, down. For up, we would now expect whatever was previously the x should now be the y, right? Because now anything that was going out from the hero in the rightward direction, it's rotated up so that it's facing upward. So now that will be y. x, um, I'm sorry, y, on the other hand, which was kind of going up and down, up y before is now going left, which is negative x, right? So again, we're just rotating around the circle. This is basically like sine and cosine, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, so if if you look at like what these values are, they're just the sine and cosine of 90 degree angle increments around, right? This is sine and cosine of zero. This is sine and cosine of 90 degrees. Uh, now we want 180, so now you're flipped around. So now the x that was previously going out to the right is going to go out to the left, and the y, which previously would have gone up, is now rotated around to face down, right? Again, just sine and cosine is, is all, we're, all we're doing here, right? Uh, and then the, the final for the uh, pointing downward. Again, so now, like, the x... Uh, for for whatever is going in X is now again going to go in Y. This time it's going to, to go downward. Uh, the Y is going to come from the X and again to go downward. Uh, so I believe that's everything. Let me make sure that I've got it right. I may have missed one. Or I may have, I shouldn't say missed one. I may have uh, bogarted one of them. All right, so this is going out to the right uh, and up. Right, right and up. It's it's that direction, um, right? Uh, and this one is is uh, I mean it's really just two axes that look like that, right? It's like an L. It's that it's that, right? Now we need that. We need to rotate it this way. So if we want to ro rotate it, uh, we now get our y is coming out negative x. That's correct. And our uh, our x is coming out uh, as y, which that is exactly what we expect. Yeah. Rotate it one more time. x is going out negative x. Yep. And y is coming out uh, negative y. That's also what we'd expect, right? Um, and then finally, rotated to facing down, uh, we go to um, x going out negative y and y going out regular x. So that there was one error there. I thought that looked wrong, and I was right. I think that's it. Um, that looks good to me. So then what happens is when we know that we have an attack that did get pressed, uh, then we're going to have to uh, actually insert moves into the move, move, the move queue of the glove if it actually did attack, right? So in that case... We need to say, like, all right, if you attacked, um, then we need to do some, like, logic here, if that makes sense. Uh, and we we need to push things onto the move queue. We, we sort of have, like, like, a couple things we probably want. So... The move queue entries, which are here, uh, they they would stack up as individual movements, but we probably also want uh, 
like we might uh we might want what is going on in the chat e of course enum is in c what what, is, what are you talking about enums are in c Pretty much anything you see in Handmade Hero is in C, except for operator overloading is not in C, and function overloading is not in C. We may use a thing for like profiling that has a constructor destructor. There's like one thing. I don't think we really use anything else. You would have to add some type defs, like like you know, this. You would write these like this but other than that that's basically it so pretty much like it, it it would not if you had operator overloading in a c in c uh you know you're pretty much home free for handmade hero it would not be very very difficult right so um, so yeah, but enums are, have been in C for a very, very, very long time. So, uh, back to our story. So in here, we've got kind of two concerns we have. One is we need to like push moves on to the move thing. So like, you know, if you imagined, right, you've got like some kind of like push move call, you know, that you're doing here and like whatever the weird pattern is that you want the glove to push uh you would do that so you'd, you'd basically say like okay we've got the attack x uh the attack y and you know we've got some movement that we want to do whatever that is right it's like we want to go out one uh and or something like that and then over I don't know maybe something like that so you'd go out two squares and then over one square and then you'd return right I uh, and all I wanted to illustrate here is like so there's two things there right one is the squares that it's going to move along but the other one is while you're doing that, what if you want to chain moves together? So like I do that and I want to queue up also after it finishes that, I want to queue up another move that tags on the end if this if this glove has like double tap, right? Um, if that makes sense. So double tap is <sighs> double tap is a little harder because we we need to decide how we want to store the fact that we probably only want a limited number of over like we don't want you to just daisy train attacks like five in a row we presumably want the glove to have a number that is the number of double taps it can do before returning, right? So presumably we need some way of doing like a roll check here. Like we probably want like a, uh, there's like individual moves, but then there's sort of the overall move, like a move group count or something. You know, and so you would do a thing where you do like move group count, you'd increment, and then you would only reset move group count when the move queue went all the way down to zero and the glove like returned. So it would it would really be more like, you know, if glove re um, returned to hero or if uh, glove 
with hero or whatever right so so you would have this kind of thing where you you can queue up two moves or something uh and then any taps you do after that just won't they're like eh, and you have to wait for the glove to come back all the way back to you before you can do something else right um Oh man, stretch it out. Something like that, right? So I think we want to be respecting both of those. We we want both of those things. We we don't want um, to just think about individual moves. We want to think about groups of moves and then in you know individual moves. So. <laughs> Um I guess one problem I have is I'm not sure what I would consider returning. You know, like I said, since I don't really write this kind of code, like this game design stuff, I don't normally do. So I guess the question is, what do you consider having returned to the hero anyway? Like, is that a two-stage process probably is it like okay there's a radius um and if the glove is less than that radius away from the hero and there's no moves in the move queue then it has returned even if it hasn't made it back to like its resting position it's it's the radius at which you are allowed to like start it going again I mean, that sounds right. Ish. Um, maybe. I don't really know. Again, this is not my job. Um, this is this is what game designers are, spo are supposed to do. A lot of times they don't do it. Like a lot of game designers are lousy, but it's their job, and you know it's not my job. So lousy or not, it's not my job. So I would say, uh, yeah, there's probably a radius there, and you know I don't know what we want to call. Um, this stuff but there's probably going to be like it, it basically like stats that we want to start having for various things it, you know what i mean like uh we we could just dump them all in the entity structure which it seems probably less like what i would want um because the stats The stats are probably hand authored, right? Again, this is where being game designer would be good, but so in a roguelike, you you don't really want all of the stats to be like independently rolled, do you? Like like when you create the gloves, I mean I'm just trying to think about like binding of Isaac, right? Um I'm just trying to think of like roguelikes that I've enjoyed, you know? And if you think about that, like the the items are just the items. Like there there aren't 
there aren't like randomly created items in the game. It's just it's just It's just like a set of items that somebody designs, right? Like you don't you don't have like when you play Binding of Isaac, the items are all new every time, right? You play the same game with the same items every time. There's just like different items that are that the the set of items that appear in that dungeon are randomly selected from the pool of existing of items that exist, right? So So that suggests to me that I would probably want like an authorable bank of like here's all the items like here's all the different gloves right and the gloves have their like stats on them and then yeah like if you then if you pick up modifiers the modifiers like are combined with the glove stats but they're all all of this always comes from like a group like a like a a bank of static yeah integers are not more efficient than floats by the way floats are far far more efficient than integers like by several orders of magnitude usually pun intended i suppose <clears throat> um like good luck finding a fuse multiply add for integer on most chips but you now almost always have a fuse multiply add for float not to mention the fact that you don't have to shift correct for scale um so yeah i don't know um I, I don't like I said this is not my this is not my area I don't do this kind of code uh so I'm not sure where this stuff would go I, like we could just stuff it in the entity but it may make more sense to have the entities sort of have like basically like a just a like a almost like a uh asset ID you know what I mean um where the asset ID just says like this is the stats that I have, this entity has, and then, you know, we iterate over if you've, if you've collected items, the player's items, like, uh, you know, g affect that. So I don't know. Like I said, not my area of expertise. I would have strong opinions about this, I'm sure, if I was a game designer. Um, as an engine programmer, it's just not something I think about because it's like, you know, it's a, it's preferences. It's like, what, what would, what does the designer want, right? Like, what does the designer think is good there? So, uh, that's, that's tricky for me. I don't know, but you could imagine like, um, some kind of a settings thing where we basically said like, okay, you know, if we imagined sort of the stats that determine uh the these sort of things you can do there's like a there's like a max move group count thing which is you know this would be how many uh moves can queue uh back to back without returning um there would be some kind of a damage multiplier. I guess it's a base damage value. Like, I'm just thinking like the glove, right? So, It strikes me that probably what you would want here for the gloves are like different ty move types. So, um, 
Because you're going to need a way to, like, explain this. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so I'm just trying to think about it uh, here visually, right? So suppose we create a glove, and the glove has a pattern of squares that it's going to attack. That pattern of squares, it would be very easy if that's all I needed to communicate to the player was that you're going to pick up this glove, right? And it's going to do, like, zero damage to this square, one damage to this square, and two damage to that square, right? Like, that's what the glove does. Um, that's easy to articulate because when you go to get the glove, you could just do a, like, you could do a thing that basically says, like, zero, one, two, or, you know, uh, empty, green, red, right? I mean, you could think of many ways that that could be drawn that makes it very obvious, you know? But the part that would be very confusing to try and articulate later would be, okay, now I want items that affect that. So so now the designer wants to come in and go, oh, and and like, you know, when you have that that sort of pattern, well, the final strike, if you get this item, you have a 20% chance of getting double damage on the final strike or whatever, right? Like, that's the kind of thing a designer would do. Well, how do you articulate that to the player? Because... You, all you did was just draw this thing for the glove. This item is unrelated to the glove, so how do, the, do they articulate to the player that this item affects this square of this glove, right? So to me, it would make more sense, I think, to say that there are basically square classes, right? So maybe there's like three colors or three symbols or something. So when you get a glove, it has like, you know, diamond square and circle or, or A, B, and C or one, two, and three, right? Um, and those are the different square types. And so the glove has a base damage for each of its square types, um, each of the three square types or something. And then items can say how much they add to each of the square types. You know what I'm saying? Um, so basically like, I don't know if that, I don't know if that makes more sense, right? To, to if you understand what I'm saying, but and that way you can have like interesting gloves too that invert the normal pattern. Like you could have two gloves that are exactly the same, except they have invert assignment to where the squares are. So like the same items would do opposite things to those two gloves, right? Like um, if normally the C square is the far square and the A square is the close square, you could have a reverse, like a inside out glove or whatever, right? And it flips them around. You know what I mean? Um... <laughs> Frizz, frizzy, I like that. Yeah. Um... Uh... <laughs> Uh, that's actually exactly what we should do. The glove has six slots, and if you fill them all, you can snap your fingers and half of the world dissolves. Uh, that's a very good idea. Was it six or five? For some reason, I thought it was five. I didn't pay very close attention to those movies, to be honest. It's six? I don't know. Um... So anyway, yeah, I think that's how we would probably do it. So maybe we would have a thing like uh, move square type, you know, um, and we would just have some of those, you know. So there would be like um, sort of like an equation. And, you know, probably these equations would be pretty standard, like, like, they're just going to be like these affine things. So we're like, you know, maybe there's like a stat EQ where you basically say like, hey, there's the elements of the stat equation and there's three of them, like X squared, X and affine, like X to the zero. 
um, or something like that. So maybe we do more like this where we were anticipating that these are fairly standard and we basically say, look, look, there's just like the damage for those squares and, you know, maybe there's other kind of stat EQs that go in there. Who the heck knows? I don't know. Uh, and so then you could you could multiply these together. In fact, we could say that these are just V3s. Um, that is probably the easiest thing. You know? Um, something like that. Uh, so you could basically take these things and just multiply them together. Uh, so, you know, if, if you have a thing where you're uh, – or, or add them, you know, however you want to do that. I'm trying to think of, like, what the most straightforward way to do that is. I'm trying to think of the most the, the how you would want to represent that. Well, how do we have to just write the code and back it out? It's probably too presumptuous to actually put it in here, right? Um, but so you're going to have some random stuff like that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Uh, and the reason I say, like, we probably want to make this something that we have ways of composing is because there's there might be a lot of these, right? Like, you might have things like, okay, you know, this this happens and is, is there a poison gas cloud or is the, are you in the water or whatever? Right. And you would probably, we probably need to have like random expressive things that are going on in here. So we would have some kind of a damage thing and that would be evaluated separately for each type of move square. So when you are in a particular phase of the move, anything that you hit in that square is going to have a different thing done than things in the other square. Right. So the, there's just going to be like a kind of a trade-off there, right? Um, and I like that. That seems good. And then the question would be like, I uh, I guess what else we would need? So there's there would be like stats. There would also be like move patterns. Again, I'm just trying to sketch out, like, thinking about what we've got. We have move patterns, and those are going to be, like, any set of things that is... Um, supposed to be used with the move queue. And presumably, the things that go in here would basically be, like... Hmm. So the things that go in here are going to then be, yeah, this is going to be kind of annoying. So we're going to have a thing that actually happens as you evaluate stats against entities. And the question is, like, what kind of stats are we going to have? Is there just going to be a single damage number, or are we going to have, like, status effects? Um, something like Binding of Isaac has no status effects, right? Uh, And I guess I don't have a strong opinion about that. It seems a little bit unnecessary. Like, it might just be, like, too complicated at that point. Like, because now you have to think about, like, what the move patterns are. And now you're also thinking about, like, status effects that are going to happen. I think the reason that I don't know 
that status effects make a lot of sense here is because the problem with status effects is they assume you have the ability to like actually equip. Let, let me just talk this out, right? So the way I would say is status effects are not going to be things you can adapt to, right? So it would just be like, do you end up getting a weapon that has fire damage or not, right? Normally the reason things like that would be interesting in games is if you can have like a more balanced approach because you you know you take multiple weapons with you and you like plan for that or whatever uh or you're like oh I'm going into the area that has like a lot of poison creatures so I need to be able to wear my poisoned um resistance necklace or whatever right in a binding of Isaac style game you don't have you only have one attack right so you don't have the ability to do those sorts of things and in this game I don't think However, okay, that said, you do have the idea of hopping on the tiles. And so maybe that's where that comes from. Okay, so I would say we probably do have that, actually. So we are going to have a bunch of things here. So, so basically, the move pattern, whatever the move pattern is that we load up, right? Um, the move patterns are going to have to have, like, basically all of this stuff in there. So we say the move pattern has which square type each thing is, right, um, and where those squares are. And presumably that's basically like a thing that maybe gets copied directly. I don't know if it actually would or no, it wouldn't because it gets transformed first. So there's a move pattern entry um, and a move pattern, and these are the things that we would actually have to have for an individual glove. We load this out of here and we go and we don't really know what it has in it because until we get further down, we don't know all the things, but we know at least it's going to have a concept of a move square type, which is just like, you know, I want to be able to mark those. Uh, so like the L shape we were making now, I want to be able to mark like the ones that are close as a different type as the ones that are far. For example, that's the thing I would like to have to experiment with in the gameplay. If we end up deciding it's not that interesting, we can pull it out, but I, I want to at least try it uh, before I would decide that. So uh, the move pattern entries, you know, there's some entries in this thing, and I don't know how many we have max. I haven't thought about that. We'll set that to whatever we actually want. But then we've got, like, uh, each thing in the move pattern is going to have a, um, a type and a delta, right? A normal, a normal delta, so a like rightward delta or whatever. I don't know what we want to call this. Like a facing, facing to the right, um, it would have a rightward delta, a rightward normal delta, canonical delta, right? Um, and I think that's all there is in a move pattern um i guess we'll throw in one more thing for good measure which is is it interruptible uh and maybe we would do something like that is it interruptible or ubble It's Tibble. So, so in general, I guess I would say we 
we have move patterns, right? They look like this. We know that we're going to have something that happens here, but this could be... We have no idea how this is going to work. Uh, this is just going to be something that, like, we start writing some code to evaluate these and some stuff happens, right? Um, so whatever happens there happens. We don't know. We probably need some things in the stats for, like, the speed of the glove. Um... And I guess I don't know. TK Dev, uh, your suggestion is not useful. Um, so I guess what I would say is I don't know what we want for speed stuff because, again, that gets down into the stat stuff, which we don't really know what we want to do. But I think this is roughly what we need. So we need something where we can have patterns. Those patterns will get copied into a queue. Um, the queue will have computed what we're actually going to do based off of like something that we have no idea what it looks like that basically gets like... Um, you know, munge down, right? So there's going to be, like, gameplay code in here that I don't know how to write or what it looks like, right? Because it's 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 entirely game designery stuff, like, how how do you want to compute damage, right? Like, it's it's not really engine stuff. It's more just, like, what what is gameplay stuff for that, right? Um, so what we want to be able to do there is just say... Okay, we've got the patterns. Patterns are stored separately from statistics, right? Patterns are just, here's the flags. Like, maybe that's only ever, can it be interrupted or not? But maybe there's other things that are important here. Who knows? Um, like, maybe, for example, another one would be like, um, like, you could imagine putting something in here that's like uh, ephemeral or something. Did that... Ephemeral. Again, we gotta check the spelling here. Yeah. Uh, so in here, right, you could imagine also a thing that's like this is allowed to phase through things and not touch them or whatever. So you know, again, these are both completely experimental. I'm just saying these are things we want to try in the game design, but the point is that's where they would go. So in the move patterns, we can specify like, oh, here's like a pattern and it can do whatever random crap. Nothing in that specifies any stats because stats are some other thing that we don't know how to do right now. Um, this is just saying here's the pattern and here's what the types of squares are. Uh, like, would they be in one of several classes, maybe there's only two classes, maybe there's five, maybe there's ten. We don't know. That's just, like, game design that we hope we won't screw up later. That has to do with the stats. Uh, then we have the actual move queue, and the move queue itself uh, is basically just a way of taking a pattern. You would combine it with the stats that we don't know what to do about, you would produce some value for each of the squares, and then the squares, then it just goes through those squares, and the gameplay gets evaluated on each one, right? Um, so I think that's, I think that's roughly what I wanted. This part, I don't know, right? Like, this part is going to have to come through, like, figuring out what is happening with monster attacks, right? And we're just going to have to, like, grind away at that at some future date. So I don't I don't know what this looks like. This it makes perfect sense, right? Um but I yeah, I don't know. Um I have no idea what's going to go on up there. Also, we have no idea what these would be, but you know, ABC seems fine for getting started. All right. So I think that's all I need and um so when we do like these push moves, so that's how this would work, right? So we would basically imagine we're going to get these move patterns from somewhere. Um, there'd be like an entry count in this thing. Um, and you can imagine we would basically have a move pattern here, and we'd just make one of these as if we got it from somewhere, which we didn't, right? 
Um, this would be like the attack pattern, right? Uh, and the attack pattern is going to be three things long, and it's going to have these in it, right? So these, um, these, uh, these moves. Uh, there's, I don't, I don't know, like, I'll just assign them each a different square type for now so that we can, if we want to start playing with that later, we can. Um, but then we have, like, the, the type, the delta, and the flags. So the delta are just these. Right? Uh, and the flags... We don't know, but I'll just set them to interruptible for now because we know we're going to want to play with that. Um, and so, you know, and, and, you know, I could even say, like, let's set it like this. So we can actually play with that as well, right? We'll just see what happens. So you can't interrupt it in the first square, um, but you can interrupt it before the other squares or something. I don't understand how the pattern is involved. Oh, uh, Rational Coder, I had a similar thought. You. Yes, uh, so what Rational Coder said, like, I totally agree that you don't want to go too far ahead, but, like, you kind of have to sketch something out that you're going to type in because I don't have anything in here, right? There's there's nothing for, like, how gloves attack, so I have to make something up to start with um, and... I know I want to try the pattern thing, so that's what we did. Uh, we don't have to do it. It could get removed, but... I don't understand how the pattern is involved in the gameplay. What is the function of a pattern? Uh, it's how a glove punches. So basically, like, when you when you do a glove punch, some gloves are just, like, they punch one square out. Other gloves will punch, like, and do damage out, like, two squares or three squares away, right? Um... And more importantly, it won't just be gloves. Like the the um the enemies we would all would be the same encoding. So basically the what we're typing in for gloves will also just be true of Monstar, right? So Monstar will have, you know, different attack patterns that they execute based on their, like, sort of random role of, like, oh, it wants to attack now, so it, you know, or whatever. That kind of stuff. Um, so, so these would probably be, unless they really suck, uh, they would probably be what we'd use for everything. Everybody just does, like, they have moves they queue, and probably, like, the monsters can't really interrupt them much. So, like, part of that part of like playing the game is probably knowing the monster patterns, right? And knowing like, oh, when a monster is executing this pattern, you know, he has to do these three things. So if I punch at this square, that's like a good move, right? Um and like yeah, a lot like a chess move, right? So sort of like real-time chess moves, right? Like this is how the knight works and this is how the bishop works and this is how the pawn works or whatever. And um, you you don't have, like, turn-taking, but you do know once someone initiates an attack that you are familiar with, you know you have that predictability that, like, it is this attack. So you can counter that attack, you know? So if we are going to attack, uh, then we are just going to try out this little thing. We've got this fake attack pattern here. And so then uh, what... Oh, someone's unhappy. Too many initializer. Oh, you're right you are, sir. This needed an additional... I guess that maybe I'll do it like that so the indentation is okay. 
Um, so if we assumed that we had some kind of a place where these things were coming from, right, rather than being defined directly inline, this is what we would get back. So then we would have a little thing here where we just loop through and say, uh, you know, okay, for each of these, This is probably move count, and this is probably moves, right? And you can see, like, this would, will just, once we get this right, you know, once or, or at least close to right, um, you can see this will just become a generic routine, right? Where you'll just pass the attack pattern, and it'll, like, push the transformed version on, right? So... What we would do here is we'd loop through these. We have the attack pattern. We pull out like one of the moves and now we just translate that move which is encoded in like canonical form into whatever the actual move is. So like in our move queue, um, and maybe I'll call this source, right? Um, and then I've got a dest, which would be the the translated version. So the delta equals the canonical delta, right? So we we know we have an attack x and attack y. So we just transform the move from its canonical form direction, right? Uh, by just doing standard, you know, standard transform, right? Uh, the damage is the part we don't know. So this is like, hey, this is the temporary thing I was talking about, right? We don't know. Um, so we can just throw that in there. Of course, well, four quarter won't like it. So we'll put it before the semicolon. Um, so we have a, a damage, we have a speed, and those are the things like the, like the stat system is going to have to supply eventually. Like, I don't know what these are, so we'll just set them to just random values here, and we'll figure that out later. Um, and then we've got our flags. I don't know why this is called interruptible still. It's supposed to be called flags. forgot to change it. And so now hopefully you can kind of see what I was talking about, right? So this comes together pretty nicely. So basically, these are the kinds of things we would define, like these little tag patterns. And then when we go into the actual uh, to issue, like an attack for a monstar or a, you know, well, it doesn't matter for anything, right? Um, we translate them from their canonical, like, pattern into an actual, like, correct facing direction um, for the for the entity and I think that's basically it right so this has to be predicated on a few things like you have to have room so if the entities move queue if the move queue count for the entity plus the the thing that you're trying to do um, that would have to be less than the size of the actual move queue so there's uh, probably that's never going to actually be a thing because presumably we simply will always set this value. In fact, we may just want to do this. Yeah. What what is what is happening? Ryan. Ryan, what is this? Can somebody go ask Ryan what that what is happening right now? So, oh, it's showing me the definition of assert, but it's it has grabbed like the entire thing. 
or something. Yeah, oh, okay, so you can see, like, it's got this heads up thing down here, I guess, where, like, I'm on, if I'm on a function, it shows the prototype of the function. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that was there. And then I guess it's just, it's just failing. Look at that. Look at how fancy. I seriously have never noticed that it does that. I gotta set the color is probably better because you can't read it, but um, that's kind of nice, isn't that? That seems kind of nice. Anyway, um, so the point is, ignoring all of that, uh, move queue overflow is probably something we want to warn on in debug because we this move group count thing is the gameplay restriction. Like, hey, if this glove has two aftertouch, then you can queue up two moves. But you should never run out of space in the move queue because the move queue should just be set to if the maximum length of an attack pattern is eight and the maximum amount of time of aftertouch you can have is three, then the move queue should be 24 long, right? We, we should never, you should never actually um, end up in a, in a place where you, um, where you overflow the move queue, that's probably just a bug, right? So what we'd like to do there is it just set that properly. And so I'd, if this ever tops out, I'd, I'd rather get told about it in development mode than it just silently handling it and moving on because it's a subtle gameplay bug at that point, right? Um, as opposed to like a crash or something. So you'd, you'd never really know. It would just feel like something didn't quite happen and you might miss it. So I'd rather have that like be loud and, and stop everything. Um, so we've got uh, another condition here, which is that um, you would have to, the move group count. Uh, also, why is this, what's the error here? Oh, it's not entity, it's glove. Um, so what we want to do here is just make sure that we always have enough, um, like the move group count for the glove. We want to make sure that the move, move group count is always less than whatever our magical like way of saying what the stat is. We don't know what that is, but like it's gonna be a thing. Um, and like this is where we now get into the part that I was saying, like I don't really know what we're gonna do. We need to evaluate, we need to have some way of evaluating what the stats are on things. And I do not really know um,
So I don't really know. Um, should the if just be the assert? No, because if if we did screw that n counting up, we don't want the game to crash or something, right? That would literally just corrupt the entity table. You know what I'm saying? So so no, definitely not. You want to balance check that uh, that push. Um, so yeah, now we are at the part where we got to think about how, yeah, how we were going to evaluate the stats. We don't care so much about what we're evaluating because we don't really know. Um, but we do have the problem of, how, how are we going to, when do we produce like the aggregate stats for an entity? Because like we're going to want to sort of have the stats for the entity be based on things that may be very like ga gameplay, like squishy, right? Like, oh, you get a plus one damage modifier for the next five rooms and uh, get plus, plus one to move square B damage uh, or like the the glove is interruptible always for this period of time or whatever you know um, when you want to add those kind of roguelike nonsense things uh, you need like some kind of a coherent place where that happens and presumably we want to not do it just in time like presumably we want to do a thing where we where we just like evaluate everything at the head of the frame and produce one set of composite stats for the entity I'm guessing you know Like, I don't know. My assumption is just, like, there should probably be a thing where we assume that at the start of the round, right, like, before brains are, like, evaluated, so before, like, you know, you or the AIs sort of, like, put in the commands for that frame, I, like, I assume what we would want to do... I assume what we would want to do is do that. I don't know. Like I said, I don't have strong opinions about these things, so I kind of have to make it up as I go along because I don't do this type of code normally. But, like, so you see this... I mean, this is basically the structure of the game update loop, right? So, basically, brains run first, and they, you know, control what's going to happen on that frame, like what things are trying to do. Um, and then we do update and render entities to like flesh everything out. I could imagine doing like, uh, before like a, one more loop up here, right. That does, that does the compute what the entity stats are for this frame or slightly differently at the tail of this so when we do update and render entities and we loop through all the entities we produce the statistics for the next frame at the at the end right um if that makes sense
I guess I would say the the latter thing sounds I mean I, again, don't really have a strong opinion about it, but I think what I would say is it seems to me like probably the smartest thing to do here would be to put that where you do update and render entities because you're always going to want to look at these stats all the time for all the stuff you're doing, right? And so presumably you just want to compute it that time. Now... I feel like this is easier said than done because we sort of now have to address how we want to handle a bunch of things that current that are previously uh, we just haven't really looked at. Like, for example, we don't have uh, any opinion on how we want our... Like, how do you even get power-ups or items or things like that, right? Um, and I don't know. I might want to think about it. Uh, how much time have we been going for? All right. It might. It, it's going to be pretty short today, actually, because uh, I got a bunch of stuff I have to do before tomorrow. So I, I probably won't go very long. Um, I don't actually know what time it is, but what time is it? Two thirty. Um, so, uh, so I do think we kind of have like two separate, we have two separate things we have to sort of do. We've got to do the move queue stuff, which seems easier. Like I've mostly got that, how I think that would work. But the stats thing is harder because even just the things I'm thinking about right now, I'm not sure what the most like sensible ways of doing those sorts of things uh in here right like again it's a case of like i'm sure i would have a strong opinions about that had i done this kind of code typically but i don't so like if you imagine what happens in here you you figure at some point you're going to pick up an item and the question is just Um, how does that item, how does that item get its stats conferred to you? So let's take the simplest possible case and work from there because that's, you know, we don't want to overcomplicate things. Um... I would say, imagine like we want the hero to pick up a hat. So there's a hat and the hat is swappable. So if the hero picks up a different hat, they drop the hat they currently have. Right, So they can only wear one hat at a time, and they pick up different hats throughout the game, potentially. So, you know, one of the hats gives you plus one damage, and the other gives you plus one speed, or whatever. So you want, while you're wearing hat A, you want plus one damage. While you're wearing hat B, you want plus one speed, and you just want them to be able to switch at any time. Like, when they hop over... A different thing it should switch and your stats should change um i'm too tired today 
I ain't getting sleep. Mm, and I didn't have any coffee. Well, that's not true. I had decaf coffee, but that's the same as not having coffee. Um. So the question is, those are obviously have to be entities. So because they're going to exist in the world and you can drop them and they get drawn. Right. So the hats are obviously entities. The. Uh, the entity system would presumably just need a thing that was like, I'm carried by and and then the question is just like how do we efficiently how do we efficiently say that you add your stats into the person who you're carried by? One way that comes to mind is you just have like a ping pong buffer where you basically say, like, entity stats, ping pong in this thing. Seems, like, overcomplicated. But you have, you, you know, if you don't want to do multiple passes, I'm not sure what else you'd do. Because... If you're going through all the entities and you want to go through the entities only that one time, you know, like you, you only want to go through them. Of course, are we already, you know, could we just do this when we initially do the unpack? So I suppose I don't really know. Um, there's sort of the world unpacking process here, right? There's begin sim, simulate, end sim. And We, we operate with entities like in the cache, right? And the sim So, like, since we rebuild this thing every time, I guess the thing we could do here is we could just say, okay, we clear... Hmm... I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure how you want this to work. When we add the entity to the hash, that means this, that the entity is going to get operated on this frame. Um, we, we could clear a stat 
holder at that point and move I mean like here's the thing I was thinking I I don't know if I think this is particularly good uh So here's add entity to hash. Um, and when it goes into the hash, at this point, you could do a thing where you said, all right, uh, the entities like active stats um, You could do something like this, where when the entity gets brought into the working set of entities for a simulation, it basically says, hey, okay, we're going to take all the accumulated stats for the entity at that point. We're going to move them and say that they are now the active stats for the entity that will operate across this particular frame. Um, and then we clear out the accumulator. Then when we update all of the entities, when we go through the thing calling update entities, uh, we just say that if you are someone who affects another entity, you accumulate at that point, right? So it's like one frame that, you know, every frame you, recomp you recompute the stats as part of the sweep, and then the next frame those stats take effect. You know what I mean? Anyone? Anyone? No. That's just that's just a vague guess, right? That's just a vague guess. So in the entity struct, uh, we would just have like whatever the stats are um, that we keep, which, you know, again, we really don't know what that looks like. Um, there would be a thing that's like accumulation stats uh, and active stats that are just things that you work on there. Uh, and then we have the base stats up here, right? And so basically like every time you you kind of just like work through that. Have you considered dynamically calculating stats based on the current modifiers? I mean, that is what we're doing. Do you mean every time you go to look at an entity's stat for any reason, you recompute all the stats on the fly right there? Is that what you mean? Like the, like when you need want to ask a question about the damage, you go iterate through all the entities that might be affecting the damage, and you compute it just right there. Um, I mean, you could do that, but that sounds kind of risky, right? Like as things start, as more things start to happen on the screen, you're suddenly potentially recomputing the same thing like many, many, many times, right? Um, and furthermore, you'd have to create acceleration structures specific to that because like, how do you even know which entities might affect it? So you'd have to start keeping like a list. Like, here's all the entities that are currently potentially affecting this person's damage level, right? I mean, and why bother, you know, like why bother when you could just, while you're sweeping over all the entities, which you know you're going to do to do their update anyway, why not just have them dump stats into anyone who they think they affect at that time? And that way there's really no need for additional 
thought to it, probably, right? I mean, do, doesn't it seem just more sane to not do it that way? To not to not have to have ways of quickly coming up with these values just in the moment so that you don't have to care They never get stale. Well, they might. I mean, they might actually be... You, you still have the order dependency problem, right? So if you compute the stat when you ask for it, well, what if a, one of the other entities that would have affected your stats hasn't updated yet that frame? And you... So when you go look and see, oh, that entity is going to have... It says it has five damage or whatever. So you add that five damage into your computation then you get to that other entity in the update step and oh it turns out it died so it, it shouldn't have contributed right or whatever so you really aren't it's not really more correct it's just different right it's just a different order of operations but it can still totally be wrong in exactly the same way this could be wrong because you'd have the opposite problem here where it's like well you're going to use the previous, like, you're going to use the post-update state of the entity on the last frame always, right? Um, and never the post value from this frame, which maybe is better or maybe is worse but at least it's consistent whereas the just in time one you have no idea it just depends on the order of updates of the entities right In fact, as I'm saying it, I think there's actually a good reason not to do it the way you're suggesting. Because that would always be order dependent. Like, which order do you update the entities in determines what the outcome is of that, of those stat rolls. Where using the a definitive set of stats that get computed on the final frame seems a lot better. Because at least then it doesn't matter what order you ask the stats in. You know? So I, I think I'm kind of skeptical of the approach that you're saying now that I think about it. I think that sounds more error prone, not less. Whereas if you update the stats every frame in a double buffered way, basically, then you know that the stats for any given frame are what they are. They don't change based on where you are in the entity update order. You don't suddenly use a different set of stats halfway through, you know? Yeah. So I think I think I would say that it, it it does seem like that's something you would want. I don't know. Hard to say, uh but seems like it. Uh this is not really necessary because hey, is that the only A tan 2? How many A tan 2s do we have? Sadly, we do have, looks like we do have one A-Tant in there. I see what we did here. We just we just wanted to be able to do the orbit and pitch values, reverse engineer them from where the camera currently was, which is, you know, it's noble. Um, anyway, so this thing is just 
the D sword Y, D sword X thing, right? So the facing direction here, I think we could probably just write down. Um, but it is just the attack X vector, so I think I think this can just be subbed in for this moment. We shouldn't. We should just set a separate value for that and not do it that way. Um, sort of a separate issue, but uh, let's go back to what we were looking at here. So we do want the glove stats. Um, and maybe since we're going to be referring to these like lots of times, we want to just call them, instead of active stats, maybe we just call them the stats. Is stats, stats is a function? It's it's in C time. <laughs> okay. I like that we're loading C time as part of the uh dev dev belbiv devotes set here. Um okay. So I think maybe we just call it stats because that's what everyone uses, and then there's like a stats accum. Right? Uh and then the base stats are like a different thing, right? Or whatever, blah blah blah. So in here we would do something like this. Uh, I'm I'm not gonna say that it's gonna look exactly like this because it's probably not. Uh, but it will look something like this, right? When we add the entity to the hash, uh, we would have like. Uh, Maybe like be get or or um, advance entity stats or something like that, and so we would call a function here that was just like advance entity stats, and I'll grab that out and put it here. When we see that, we do the little duff double buffer swap. So we're good to go. Uh, and that maybe goes into the entity side of things, right? So there's this. And I guess then anyone can look at what those stats are like so and choose to make decisions about it. Um, in fact, you could even sketch out what this looks like at that point, because now you could say, well, whatever the move pattern entries square type was, you could do the glove stats um damage for that move square type right so glove stats speed for that move square type and and now it's actually sort of a thing um i'm going to get rid of the coefficient thing for now because hey like I don't really know what we're doing here, so I'm just going to say it looks maybe like that. Um, and then we'll figure out how the coefficient stuff would work later. Like, we'll figure out how to get something fancier in there when we're ready. Uh, the entry count thing for attack pattern, it's actually move count. Um, same here. And then the move queue entry dest this is actually the glove move queue. First of all, this should be a star. We're writing to it. So there's that. Uh, but the move queue 
it's just whichever is actually this value. And each time we push something on, we want to advance that value. All right. So I think that's basically it. The glove with hero following stuff is sort of like a separate issue now. And I don't actually know what we're going to do with that. So maybe we'll save that till next time. But I think we're more or less where we need to be. Um, so I think that was good. Uh, I'm sure this isn't great. Because like I said, I, I don't write this kind of code for a living. So I don't know. But that looks like a solid enough stab. And now we can go set some stats and try to, like, actually implement the move and attack stuff in some way. And we'll just we'll see what happens. Right. Um, I would say that if we just take the delta between these two, so if we just said, like, hey, there's a glove distance uh, that's just, like, the length squared um, between wherever the glove is and wherever the body is, um, and if the glove distance squared is less than, you know, whatever, I don't know what it is, something like that, then you're you're back with the guy. You know what I mean? Um, now this would presumably only happen when there wasn't anything in the move queue. Uh, so right, you're only going to reset it if there's nothing in the queue and you're back. Then you do this. Um, and off we go. Now, there's probably a few other little things in here, like, okay, if the move queue count is zero, um, and you didn't attack, you would want the glove to, like, find its way back towards the hero. So, like, the actual target, like, basically, I think we do next time is, like, okay, now we're going to actually start the movement code because we kind of know how everything is going here. Um, you know, like, set a return move when there's no moves in the queue. Um, or where does... Does the movement code live for that? I don't know. So I think that's basically it. Um, I'm going to say that's it for today. Because like I said, today it has to kind of be a short day. That was a little... It was a little bit of like, okay, let's just try to poke around in here and see what the heck makes sense. But that seems good. I'm relatively happy with that. Uh and I think it'd be pretty easy for us to put that to like use the same stuff for multiple things. So I think enemies can use that as well and it'll be reasonable. So, all right, that's about it. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you everyone for joining me and I will maybe find someone to raid. Maybe, um, I guess we'll see if John is streaming. Of course he's not. Um, well. Uh, yeah. I guess we're, we don't know. So you're going to have to find your own thing. And I'm sure you will. And and I wish you the best of luck on that stream. Take it easy, everybody.